Many of you were wondering, where are MSI's 800 series ITX boards? They made a very good B650 ITX board, but it's been very quiet until lately. And the new one, it's finally here. So let's take a look at the new MPG B850i today. Welcome to Machines and More. MSI's B650 ITX is one of the ITX boards that I reviewed a few years ago and recommended when uh, AM5 first came out. And this new B850i that was shown at uh, Computex this year further improves on that. Before we begin, I do want to let you know that the board was provided by MSI for my review and big thanks to them. However, I am not paid by MSI for this review. They are not a sponsor on this channel. And as always, you can expect well-researched and objective review feedback. The B850i Edge TI Wi-Fi is part of MSI's MPG lineup. And while it's not part of their higher tier MEG enthusiast uh, board designation, it's still quite a nice board with good features and it will be a very good option for any AMD AM5 socket ITX build right now. The B850 chipset is your more standard mid-range option right now. It does go all the way up to X870E, but for ITX right now, the highest end chips available is the X870 anyway. Uh, MSI does have an X870 ITX board. I haven't checked that one out yet. Hopefully we'll see a review on that soon. In my opinion though, B850 should check off all the boxes for most builders. MSI's implementation gives a Gen 5 slot and one Gen 5 M.2, and what you are missing out on is going to be a 40 gig USB 4 port, which you will get on X870 boards. On the rear I.O., this board has the same port setup as the previous MSI B650i, just one 20G Type-C port, also three Type-A 10G ports, and finally two 5G-A ports, and that's it. We can compare to ASUS's B850-i, which is going to be my main point of comparison today. The ASUS has a 20G C port, which is the same, but a total of five 10G ports. One of those is type c but has two 2.0 ports so both in port count and speed the asus is going to be a little bit better there where the a50i makes an improvement is in networking this now steps up to wi-fi 7 and realtek 5g ethernet and the spec here is going to be better than most uh, itx manufacturers on the market because up until now the 2.5g is going to be the best available and uh, as I saw at Computex, all three of MSI's new 800 series ITX boards will have that 5G e spec. Now, one thing that's nice about the Wi Fi antenna is that it uses a quick push fit connector, just like other brands have been adopting. But MSI's actually still has a little bit of thread to allow you to use an RP SMA antenna if you have one of your own that you prefer, or you have some type of, like uh, the shorter ones that you like, right? You can use it with this. Additionally, at the back, the A50i is updated with optical audio and it still has a mic and a line out. The top, the very important clear CMOS button and a BIOS flashback button. Now, one complaint that I had on the B650i was that the clear CMOS button was quite proud and it was easily to accidentally press and clear all your settings. I did note that the new one, it's a little bit shorter here, which is an improvement. Now it might still make more sense if it were flush with the surface so the user would have to be more intentional about pressing it, but I'm glad to see that they reworked that one here. Finally on the back for integrated graphics, we have the single HDMI port, which is identical to the 650i. Moving over to the front of the board, we have a 10 layer PCB here. Still the silver color scheme like the previous B650i. The expansion slot is now upgraded to a Gen 5 slot. This expansion slot features a standard release. You have to depress the latch to release your card, unlike with Asus's Q-Release Slim or Aorus's button, which will release the card. That just may be slightly more difficult within mini ITX confines to actually get to that button. So. Uh, the ASUS and Gigabyte options are a little bit more quality of life in this regard. And above that, there is a fan-equipped heatsink. Now, the primary function of this is to cool the Gen 5 M.2 that installs underneath it. One thing I noted was that the thermal pad only covers half of your drive. The fan blows air directly on the other half. However, the mini fan also circulates to the surrounding areas, such as the power delivery and the chipset. And while users may find this type of board fan to be a nuisance, you can just adjust the fan level in BIOS. And when we get to the performance discussion, I'll cover some of the temps as well as the impact of adjusting that fan. 
For front panel USB, you have a 5G Type-A header and a 10G Type-C header and two SATA data ports. And like the B650i, it does come equipped with a debug LED. The location of the fan headers are like the B650i. You have three. Two of them are to the right of your RAM slots, and the third is at the bottom to the right of the M.2 heatsink. The ARGB is to the right of that in a fairly tight spot, so it's not as convenient a layout as, say, ASUS's typical layout, which is, you know, everything at the top. And you got two DIMM slots here for DDR5. Bottom left here is where your front panel connectors are. This is going to be a longer run than comparable ITX boards, which are typically at the bottom right or middle on the right side. But most cases should have enough cable for you just have that cable that's gonna span across the board, which may be unsightly. And the onboard audio connector is also there as well. And that is using an ALC4080 codec. For power delivery, the board features an 8 plus 2 plus 1 setup with 90 amp stages. This is an improvement over the B650i, which used 80 amp stages, but is weaker than, say, ASUS's B850 setup, which is 10 90 amp V core stages, or Gigabyte's XA70i, which has an 810 amp V core stage setup. That being said, with this setup, you shouldn't have any issues running any AM5 CPU at stock power levels. If you do want to overclock Ryzen 9's past stock TDP, that's when I would recommend stepping up to a board with bitter uh, power delivery. And even then, within Mini ITX, your typical limitation is more so how much cooling you can deliver to the CPU and not so much the board. Overall layout of the heatsinks is reasonable. You don't have a very tall M.2 heatsink. The rear I.O. heatsink is not particularly wide either. The portion that covers the power delivery is not tall or intrusive, so cooler compatibility will be just like the B650i, which is quite good. On the back of board, this is an MPG board, so typically we don't see any back shields until we get to the MEG level with MSI. And there is one component, which is a Gen 4 compatible slot for an M.2. So overall, the board is quite good uh, versus the B650i. The main set of improvements are gonna be that Gen 5 expansion slot and the M.2, plus a networking spec and slightly better power delivery. And that being said, if you have the B650i already for me, there's not enough of a difference to warrant upgrading. If you want the 5GE or Gen 5 M.2, then sure. However, for the expansion slot, current Gen GPUs, the Gen 5 slot, just not gonna be a meaningful difference versus Gen 4. And the power delivery, I don't think most users are gonna notice that. To set this up, I tested in the Cooler Master NR200 and I took the opportunity to test out their new Atmos 2 AIO. It's a really neat cooler and the review is inbound for that. I used the Ryzen 9 9900X here and to give you an idea how the board performs, let's talk about a heavy multi-core render first. With Blender at stock settings, the chip clocked in slightly lower than the ASUS B850-i on both CCD1 and CCD2. This averaged to a roughly 60 megahertz drop versus that board. Throw in the Aorus XA70i and that difference is about 75 megahertz. About one-ish percent and we'll see a similar performance gap here in the render times. Now, interestingly, it does run about 1.5 to 2 watts lower than the other boards at stock settings. The MSI B850i does seem to be slightly tamer at stock settings than the other two I'm showing here. On the single core boost clocks, the B850i drove the 9900X mostly to spec. In theory, the 9900X can go up to 5.6 gigahertz occasionally and for light loads. Now it's important to note that here the CPU does boost beyond this level. This number I'm showing here is just the average. So every now and then it does jump up to 5590 or so. The ASUS is marginally ahead here, but this is not a meaningful difference uh, for gaming, here I tested with Far Cry 6. On the CCD that was delegated for gaming, I recorded an average boost clock of 5364 MHz. With this title, we'll typically see core boost up to 5.4 GHz. Uh, sometimes the CPU really doesn't use every single core on that CCD, and that's completely normal. The MSI here is just slightly behind the ASUS, which was 5393. So on the clocks, I think the ASUS BA50i uh, is going to be marginally ahead. It's not enough to where I would choose one over the other solely based on the performance, but it is something to note. Now on the board BIOS, there's a game boost mode that you can enable in the easy modes UI. All that does is <laughs> dials in a preset PBO setting with a very 
conservative negative five curve offset and um, this raises the PBO scalar to 10x, which is actually a little bit aggressive. Without power limits, you are just going to be raising the power consumption of the chip. So you're gonna see slightly higher clocks here because of the curve offset, but the chip will run a lot hotter. So in my opinion, the proper way to do this, at least in ITX, should be to impose a manual power limit as well. And then here you can also raise the boost clock ceiling. And I really wouldn't recommend dialing up the PBO scaler to 10X. I think five to seven X is fine for this type of PBO purpose. Turning our attention to the board temps. I mentioned the mini fan that many of you dislike. As an example, at stock, the chipset A temps got up to low 60s with the fan hitting almost 7,000 RPM, which is definitely audible at that point. Now, one thing is it's indexed to the CPU temp by default, which isn't necessarily a good proxy for chipset temps, and by extension, the speed that the fan should run at, right? So we can go ahead and just change this in BIOS, change the index to the chipset A sensor, and then we can just bring that down, the curve can be brought down to max out at 2,700 RPM or so, which that's kind of where I found difficult to hear over the cooler fans. At the lower RPM, we see only a small increase in chipset temps and the VRM most temps are still fine. So this is a change I would recommend users to, to make in order to save a lot of uh, noise. For M.2 temps with my Gen 5 drive, it did run a tad warmer than I expected, especially compared to some other boards. Now, typically this one lands in the mid 70s. I set a higher fan speed just to test the impact. For example, at 3700 RPM, it makes a very small impact on the temp. So I think this cooling solution runs the drive slightly warmer. For your reference, here is the sound on the minivan, noting that out of the box, if you don't make any changes for a CPU heavy load, you are likely to hear it get up into that 7000 RPM range because it's indexed out to the CPU temp out of the box. Right now, the board is priced pretty aggressively at 250 US. Now, I don't know how long it's going to stay there and what the price is gonna be in the future, but I do like the price point right now because it's very similar to how the B650i was when it came out. And by comparison, the ASUS is a full $50 more at $300. Strengths of this board, the networking spec, it's very, very good. No one else has 5GE on an ITX board now, right? Uh, strong quality of life features such as the BIOS flashback, the clear CMOS button, and the debug LED. The build of the board is good, and uh, you have optical audio on the back, and I think many users will find the price very attractive relative to the other options on the market. But things to be aware of, the power delivery, while it's adequate, it's absolutely not a strength of this board. Uh, the performance tested out okay, but it was not stellar and the USB features that should be good enough for many users, but again, that is not a strength of this board. And you won't wanna address that mini fan right away, but I think that's a relatively easy fix to make. The color scheme kind of straddles the spectrum. It's not black, it's not white, it's silver, but it has black trim. I can understand why they did that. They're only doing one ITX board in this chipset. Uh, so it's wise for MSI to be a bit more universal, so to speak. This is the color scheme they've chosen for their other 800 series ITX boards. And while it would look fine in a white build or a black build, at the same time, it's not perfect for either end. That being said, if you are doing an AM5 ITX gaming build, I would absolutely go for this one. I really don't see a huge reason to go past this level. Uh, the combination of the price and the features, it's just a very wholesome package and gamers will be very happy with this one. If your priority is better power delivery or USB, the Aorus XA70i, which has a 40 gig port, or ASUS's B850-i, which has more USB connectivity, plus uh, another Gen 5 M.2 drive, those might be better fits. But I think in terms of the features that really will matter for most users, this one uh, checks off all the boxes.
So I hope you enjoyed and found this review helpful. Please give a like. If so, make sure you are subscribed. Please go ahead and check out the board. The link's down below. It is available now. And a big thanks for watching. Thank you.